And we're going to begin with a call from Danny Golding, who's ringing from York. And Danny, you, you've got a vote in this contest. I have, yes. So what's your question to Jeremy? Corbyn? OK, Jeremy, um, it's good to be speaking to you, and I'm really pleased that you've brought so much um, life and energy, energy to this campaign. Um, my question is this. Um, anyone who spent time campaigning in the marginal seats in the last election would have quickly found that voters were deserting Labour for the Tories and UKIP because they didn't trust us on immigration, on benefits, and particularly on the economy. Um, John Cruddis, who was one of the MPs who nominated you, has been carrying out an inquiry which found that a lot of those voters thought we weren't offering enough austerity, not that we are offering too much austerity. So my question is, how do you think your policies will win back these voters and get, w help us win victory in 2020? Danny, thanks for your question. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a bad throat from all the campaigning. Um, I spent some of the last election campaigning in marginals also, and I spent uh, several days in Thanet um, campaigning there for our candidate, where Nigel Farage was trying to win the seat. And uh, so obviously UKIP were a huge factor there. And it was very interesting that uh, when one got to a discussion about education, about housing, about wage levels and jobs, a lot of people were very, very open to that, and I was making the point to them, as I make now, that austerity has brought about big cuts in public expenditure, has brought about considerable degrees of hardship for a lot of people, and that if we have a growing economy rather than an economy of cuts over the next five years, then we begin to be able to provide those services that are necessary for everybody else. Danny, I'd also do you think say that to, message would be convincing to the marginal voters in York? Well, I think it could be because... The, I just want to bring Danny back in for a yeah. second. Uh, Sorry, well, Danny, come on back in. Yeah. York's a very safe seat. Now, that message will go down well here. But I think the reality is in, in Thanet, if you take an example, we, Labour didn't win it. That was one of our target seats. It was sure. won by the Conservatives. And in West Yorkshire, where I was campaigning, we lost a whole swathe of target seats because voters didn't feel that we were addressing their concerns about the economy. And um, my concern really, Jeremy, about your campaign is you don't seem to be reflecting back um, the, the very real kind of concerns that a lot of us were hearing on the doorstep. Well, we were offering in the election, if we're honest about it, austerity light when the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats were offering austerity heavy. So even if we had won the election in May, and I obviously wished we had, I worked very hard to try and achieve that, then um, we would now be making cuts in local government expenditure, we would now be dismissing civil servants, we would now be saying to many of the poorest and most vulnerable in this country that you have to join in paying the price of austerity. I think it was the lack of a clear alternative that was one of the problems. I'd also say to um, voters who may not themselves be in particular economic difficulties at the moment that uh, they have older relatives, they know people who have mental health conditions, they know people who need public services, they also have children who are going to want somewhere to live in the future. So I think a coherent economic approach, which is about a growing and above all more equal economy, would actually mm -hmm. resonate very well with many of those voters. And I've spent a lot of my life uh, obviously as a Member of Parliament, but before that I was an agent for the Labour Party in uh, Hornsey, now Hornsey and Wood Green, and I, I fully understand the campaigning instincts and the need to get a message across that says to everybody, actually, a more equal society is good for all of us. Right. OK, thanks very much indeed <coughs> uh, for your call, Danny. Let's talk now to Sherry Hughes, who's calling from the Wirral. Oh, hello, Jeremy. Hi. Hi, thank you for taking my question this afternoon. Um, Jeremy, why do you call Hamas friends? I was in a meeting in the House of Commons for a very serious discussion about um, <clears throat> excuse me, the opportunities for peace in the Middle East. And um, I said to everyone in the room, welcome to all our friends here, let's have a discussion. I think the remark has been taken quite seriously out of context by a lot of people. I have, can, I, can, I, can I finish a moment? I have also met in the company of other members of parliament, Hamas whilst visiting Gaza, as indeed Tony Blair has met representatives of Hamas. Does it mean I agree with or approve of what Hamas says or does? No, it does not. What it does mean is that I think you have to have a discussion that includes Hamas if you're to bring about any kind of okay, peace that's process. Clear, but let's, and indeed, let's, let's, the Israeli let's, government... Let's Sherry, she, I think she yeah. wanted to come oh, sorry, back on I that. didn't understand that. Yeah, Sherry, Sherry, go ahead, yes. Me, I absolutely understand 
understand as an old style international socialist you believe in dialogue jeremy as as do i however i do not see why you need to extend that to the epithet of friend to an organization that according to amnesty international has carried out a brutal purge against fellow palestinians in 2014 which amounts to war crimes i mean the list's endless i could tell you so many things that hamas are guilty of currently executing barbers for cutting women's hair or at least arresting them and potentially executing them seeing as they seem to do that to people they have in custody and then accuse them of being collaborators so i wonder why you need you felt the need to actually call them friends okay let's let jeremy corbyn answer that i can quite happily discuss sure. things with people without terming them friends okay the war crimes investigation of 2014 is about the whole totality of Operation Protective Edge and also includes the behaviour of the Israeli Air Force and Israeli Army in the assault on Gaza in which uh, 1,500 people died. And so that war crimes investigation... Before we get too much into the detail of all this, perhaps you can even address Sherry's main point, which is on the idea of calling them friends. Do you think that that was a mistake? Is that something you'd like to withdraw? I used it as a diplomatic language in a meeting. I have met elected representatives of Hamas um, in Gaza in the company of members of parliament from 60 different... uh, 60 members of parliament, rather, from all across Europe during one delegation between Operation Cast Lead and Operation Protective Edge. Does it mean that I consider the policies of a mass appropriate and ones that I agree with? Absolutely, of course I don't. You know very well my views on the death penalty, my views on torture, my views on human rights issues. There are people who think that we can get a peace process by ignoring them. Sadly, that cannot be the case. And even the former head of Mossad is now saying it's time for Israel to have open discussions with Hamas. They've already had... Um, how should I put it, proximity talks, including Hamas in Cairo, which brought about the welcome ceasefire yeah. at the end of Operation I, Protective Edge. But I do want to move on because we've got dialogue, a lot of people who want to talk to you. Dialogue, so. dialogue is essential okay. if we're to bring about a long-term peace process. Sherry. And I look forward to the war crimes investigation, which will affect a lot of people in the region. And Thank I you. said it's not just one-sided, it includes Israel as well. Thank you very much indeed for your call, Sherry. Let's talk to Lee Barnett now, who's calling from uh, Richmond. Are you a, a Labour member? Yes, I am. I, good afternoon, Mr Corbyn. Good afternoon, Lee. I joined the Labour Party, my first political party, on the 8th of May at the age of 50. Okay. Since then, Welcome. I'm coming to think that I've made a mistake, especially when seeing online the anti-Semitic abuse and the Holocaust denial posted by those who say they're your supporters. Instead of merely suggesting the debate should be polite... Why don't you tell those who post such material, I don't want your support. The Labour Party doesn't want you in it. You're loathsome people. Go away. You've loathsome views. I don't want to be elected on the votes of anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers. Because until you do, at best you ignore what's happening, and at worst you give the impression you actively condone it. Lee, absolutely you do not condone it, and I think you know very well that I do not condone that in any way. I have spent my life as a campaigner against racism. My parents were campaigners against racism. My mother was there in Cable Street alongside the Jewish and Irish people opposing the rise of Nazism in Britain. Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, far-right racism is totally wrong and absolutely obnoxious. And I've made that absolutely clear to everybody who will listen to me on this subject. And I'm sure you and I can agree that the the strength of any community and society is respect for its diversity, respect for its multi-faith uh, credentials, but above all, absolute opposition to racism and intolerance in any form that it arises. Lee, thank you for your call. But there have been questions raised about the kind of people that you associate with. Story in the papers today about the fact that you invited Diane Abu Jarjar to the Commons as a special guest. Now, this is a man who's talked about hoax gas chambers. Sorry, who? You've not met him? No. I, well, I, I've, I've, I saw the name this morning and I asked somebody, who is he? Right, so this was somebody who was well, reported uh, look, today. Well, my, uh, that's it. So you, you, you definitely didn't well, look, invite my, this man to the Commons my, as a special guest. My views are 
that the Holocaust was the most disgraceful and vile process of the history of the 20th century, if not the wider world. And that has to be understood by successive generations and has to be understood by all our children in schools. That surely is important. The idea So just that, to be absolutely sorry, clear on this, that, but there's that an accusation I, which I think sorry, you're denying. I'm giving you the opportunity to deny the it. The idea... You didn't I'm invite sorry, this man. Sorry, can I answer, please? The idea that I'm some kind of racist or anti-Semitic person is beyond appalling, disgusting and deeply offensive. I have spent my life opposing racism. Until my dying day, I will be opposed to racism in any form. I, I, OK, you've made that very Thank clear. That, but on this particular accusation, which I'm sure you'll want to answer, you're saying you've not met this man. He's a Lebanese-born activist. He's now banned from the UK. He's someone who said that he considered every dead British soldier a victory. It's been reported that you invited him to the House of Commons as a special guest. Is that something you're denying? I'm sorry, I don't know who this person is. OK, you've made that absolutely clear. Let's move on uh, to our next caller now, and it's Marlon Minty who's ringing in from Reading. Oh, hi. Uh, hello, Jeremy. Hi, Marlon. Um, before I go any further, just to say, uh, we're, me and my friends and family are very pleased to have someone uh, running for the leadership who genuinely represents what the party should be standing for. Um, but uh, my question today uh, is mainly to do with housing. Um, and obviously we're in a period of uh, you know, history where housing is having a massive boom and is worth a great deal of money. Um, I just wanted to know how your uh, sort of terms, in terms of financially, how you'd be looking to support people who are looking to buy a home who don't necessarily have a family and are possibly looking to get something uh, by themselves, but also uh, without having to sell off uh, social housing, as we've seen under the right to buy scheme supported by the Conservatives. Uh, thanks, Marlon. Um, housing is an issue that is very dear to my heart. I represent an inner city constituency and housing is the hugest issue that I face in my constituency advice bureaus. In short, a number of issues. One, I want to ensure that central government either provides capital resources, support through a national investment bank or borrowing opportunities for local authorities to build more council housing and build sufficient stock of council housing that single people as well as many desperate families can actually get somewhere to live which is secure and a tenancy for lifetime. Secondly, that the private rented sector which in some parts of Britain is now over a third of the entire community has to be better regulated, there has to be longer term tenancies, there has to be greater security of tenancy, there has to be an end to peremptory evictions and I believe there has to be a limit on the rent levels that can be charged so it becomes affordable. Otherwise, we end up with effectively social cleansing of inner city areas of Britain and not just in London but other parts of the country as well. Marlon, I also understand the importance of people having the opportunity of somewhere to buy. I'm not in favour of selling off council or housing association stock that is necessary for people in desperate housing need. I am in favour of a state supported mortgage scheme for first time buyers, particularly for young people, including single people, because that is the fastest growing household dynamic across the whole of the UK. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for your call, Marlon. I want to move on to uh, Neville Ban, who's calling from Liverpool. And I think in a, in a related point about your economic uh, policy, uh, you've been a, a Labour member for some years. Neville. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, Neville. Uh, when interest rates can't be lowered anymore during a recession, a traditional Keynesian solution is to introduce quantitative easing as a last resort. Now, your policy has put the word people in front of it, so I'd like to know what you mean by that. But very, very importantly, is it only to be used during a recession, as Keynesians would argue? Uh, no, I, we've put £325 billion in quantitative easing into the banks, which is uh, labelled a loan, but in reality it's uh, a loan that I don't expect the Bank of England expect to collect from the banks that have had that those sums of money. What I'm suggesting, and it is a suggestion and a proposal that I hope we'll have a fuller economic commission to consider, is that some of that money be used to fund the establishment of a national investment bank, and that national investment bank would be 
tasked with um, funding improved infrastructure, rail infrastructure particularly, but also be tasked with funding improved housing, and I mentioned that in answer to an earlier question, would also be tasked with funding things like improved broadband access across the whole of the UK, and also, crucially, investing where necessary and where appropriate in um, new high-skilled jobs in engineering and manufacturing industry because we have far too great an imbalance between financial services and manufacturing in Britain. 80% of the workforce are now working in the service sector. Well, let's, let's Most European to... countries have done far better on promoting manufacturing industry than we have. So let's go there, back there's a number to... of issues there. Sure. Let's go back to Neville now. Do you think that that's um, convincing? Do you want to see quantitative uh, no, easing being... I asked Jeremy was, do you use quantitative easing when there's a recession, as it is normally used? Your advisor, Richard Murphy, has, in my, from what I can see, has said both, sometimes during a recession and sometimes not. So that's the key question, because that's when it's been used in the past. Will you use it outside a recession? And then the argument is that will produce runaway inflation. Well, I don't think it produces runaway inflation because it depends how much you use. Um, I would think that it's necessary and useful to use it so we actually have an expanding and growing economy. The outside problem, recession. Outside, is there... outside of a recession at the moment, we're in a sort of period of, as you correctly point out, interest rate stagnation. But we also have huge infrastructure deficiencies in Britain and we also have uh, the combination of a skill shortage and underutilisation of many qualified people. So investment in an expanding economy is surely something that will benefit all of us and that of course then in itself uh, leads to increased tax income for the oh, central government anyway. There have been questions raised about whether this would to a certain extent undermine the credibility of the Bank of England which would be carrying out the quantitative easing normally used to um, make the banking system work better or to uh, support the currency by expanding its role um, although indirectly through, an, through another bank into areas like housing could that cause a run on sterling? Is it such a bad thing if the Bank of England is tasked with doing that as well? Because uh, we do have serious lack of investment problems in Britain, particularly housing and infrastructure I mentioned, but they're not the only ones. I would have thought tasking the Bank of England with that level of responsibility would actually be a good thing. And so the National Investment Bank would be something they would establish um, and, and that would kickstart this whole process. OK, let's talk to Fiona Brown, who's calling from Tunbridge Wells in Kent. And you're someone else who's just rejoined the Labour Party this year. I have indeed. This was actually before I'd really heard much about Jeremy, uh, way back in March, after an absence following um, Iraq. So I'm glad to be back. I'm more than happy to be to have um, listened to a lot of uh, what Jeremy has to say via a young person um, that I met at the CLP. OK, uh, who was just... we've not got too much time, so if I could press <laughs> no, no, you no. to ask so, a question, um, that would be great. OK, there's lots of us oldies, um, not just young people. So what we all want to know is what, um, what you're going to do when it comes to, you're going to have to deal with fairly soon, the um, European referendum whether you're going to be behind Alan Johnson in his uh, okay. Yes campaign. OK, we got the gist. Thank you. Uh, th thanks for your question, and the campaign is great because it involves people of all ages, and that's uh, splendid. Um, on the EU, I think we should be making demands now as a party to enhance and extend the social chapter in the European Union. We should also be uh, looking at greater environmental protection and also challenging David Cameron in his uh, wish to promote the free market in Europe at the, and also to reduce the ability of people to uh, move across Europe, the free movement of labour across Europe. And so I think we should be part of that debate and part of those demands at the, at the present time. Is that a clear enough answer for you? Fiona? So it's important that we actually be, as a party, part of that whole process and so that we have a more democratic social solidarity across Europe than that which Cameron is proposing at the present time. OK, one last quick call from Ellie Curran in Manchester. You're through to Jeremy Corbyn. Hello. Um, if you are elected leader and in a year or two there's strong evidence from local government elections, Labour Party door knocking and national polls that Labour's unlikely to win a majority at the next election under your leadership, would you stand down? 
Well, we're a democratic party. We're going through the biggest democratic exercise that's ever been conducted by the Labour Party and probably any other party, 600,000 people are taking part. We don't yet know what the result's going to be, and obviously I'm looking forward to September the 12th, just like everybody else, and I want us to move might and main to actively oppose the Tories, the Welfare Reform Bill, the budget and the trade union legislation they're putting forward. And we are a democratic party, and everyone who's elected to office in the party has to be accountable, including the leader. So and, we will see what happens. And just to be clear, because this question has, has come up in the campaign, do you yourself actually want to be Prime Minister? Look, we've, I put myself forward um, in this leadership contest knowing there was a difficulty getting on the ballot paper and I'm grateful to colleagues that nominated me, genuinely so, even though they perhaps weren't so keen on the process. OK, sure. we're there. We're now in a very strong position. I'm enjoying this campaign. And do you so want to be Prime Minister? Yes, hang on, hang on finish. <laughs> Let me finish, please. I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't wanting and prepared to take on this position and the consequences that flow from it in a general election that follows after that. This is a process not just about individuals. It's about re-democratising our party. So policy comes in future, my suggestion, from the grassroots rather than an all-seeing, all-knowing leader at the top. And finally, a, a very, very difficult question for you from Twitter. Phil Breyer's tweeted to ask, do you accept responsibility for the hipster beard phenomenon? And if so, when are you going to apologise? Oh, I can't apologise for my beard. It's too long lasting. And besides, I'm very proud of my Beard of the Year awards in the Parliamentary Beard of the Year contest. And so... Um if beards are on the growth, I'm sorry about the effect on the hairdressing industry. Jeremy Corbyn, many thanks indeed for joining us today.